good to see you. Thank you. Nice you to see you again. You've got a beautiful school. Thank you. Wow. Good to see you again. You know, I, I'm, I'm so happy to see you. And uh, my name is Wadamaya, the annoying village boy from Ghana. Yeah. Everybody knows you, Wadamaya. <laughs> That's really, tell me who you are and where are you from? Yeah, I'm an African-American. Mm. Uh, I was born in the United States in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a child of the civil rights movement and uh, an artist, an educator. And I s studied in Germany. I did my art degree in Dusseldorf. And, um, you know, upon returning to America in the 80s, I was kind of surprised to meet the kind of political racial climate I met, especially since the civil rights movement where African Americans really fought for equal access under the law for their human rights. So when I went back there and I found language like, I don't know, minority recruiting and, you know, it, it was kind of weird to me, you know, to, to see how that equal struggle or equal access actually resulted in my being a permanent second-class citizen there. That I, there was a label for me now, <laughs> you know. There was a label? Yeah, minority recruiting, you know, minority this, you know. It was really interesting leaving America kind of at the end of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. which I was fully engaged. I was even in the Panther Party. Uh, to go to Europe, spend almost 12 years, and go back to America and to confront language like affirmative action and minority recruiting. And when I first heard that language, it sounded to me like the Office of Bantu Affairs. I was like, wow, you know, that's what happened for an e a struggle for equal access under the law, that this language actually kind of institutionalizes my second class citizenship in the land I was born in. And so needless to say, that was an uneasy return. And uh, anyway, I, fortunately, I had a fellowship to Harvard. That was always pleasant to have the access to that institution and all the resources it provided. And after that, I was offered a position to be a kind of artist in residence at a fancy New England prep school. And, um, you know, there were just a handful of African-American students there. And it was just interesting to be in the academy to realize how there was no presence of African studies or anything that legitimized that Africans in America come from someplace worth knowing about. Instead, all the organizations, you know, the minority students group and all seemed to have our students poised for protest to protect themselves. And you had, in America, they had this thing called Black History Week or Month. You know, and I thought, that's rather absurd. How do you take a week or a month to explain someone's existence? So rather than integrate into that culture, I decided to see, take advantage of a very affluent culture that allowed students to travel the world every time they had a short break or a, a time off. And I, I made up my mind to, to provide short-term study in Africa. And that was in 1988 I had that idea. In 1989, I came to Ghana. I went to several West African countries, but I came to Ghana specifically because I had a good friend while I was a student in Germany with whom I used to do performance art, Mustafa Tetiadi and his German partner who came to Ghana to build the African Academy of Music and Arts, AMA. So I came to visit them. And when I came to this village in 1989, I came to paradise. You came to paradise? I came to paradise. And since 1989? Well, interestingly enough, you know, I came and I was able to raise money, put on some conferences, go back to these private schools and convince them it was safe enough to do a short-term study. So I started bringing students over an extended spring break for about 17, 18 days, again, using the arts to discover the history and culture of another society. And I started bringing them to Ghana and I rented facilities from the African Academy of Music and Arts, AMA. Okay. But after doing, and it was amazing, because initially I only brought uh, Anglo-American students. And even just with having them, it had such a profound effect on how they understood so-called race relations. Because all the things they'd heard about Africans and black people, you know, all the crazy stuff, just went away. They met 
kind, open people who welcomed them. They met people, you know, when you say black, it didn't mean anything. They met Aways and Fontys and Ashantis and Hausa, and they realized that culture is what distinguishes human beings, not the color of their skin. And so already, just with that introduction, we began to, in my mind, dismantle the language of race politics. And uh, that made me understand that there was a larger opportunity here. It made you realize that there are a lot of opportunities in Ghana. Um, Antoine, you've been here over 30 years now. If, uh, is it 30 years or...? 30 years, <laughs> at least. Let's just say at least 30 years. And you established this school by yourself or you have people that supported you to well, do this? You know, um, Nobody ever does anything really by themselves. I had people that supported the idea uh, very early on. And it, I, I never had the idea to start a school. Mm. It's only when AMA, because when I brought students, you know, they, they had like a guest house. And I used to ask them, please, I don't want to have any visitors because I'm trying to run an educational program. So I didn't want weekend guests interfering with that. And the third time I did it, they said, you know what, uh, we want to keep our place. Why don't you build your own place? And that's how it happened. I never had intention of actually building a school. So like everything, it happens one step at a time. And what makes this school so unique from other schools? Well, it's because it's, it, for, for Ghana, it's an institute. I mean, for, for one moment, I had the idea of trying to create a high school semester abroad here. But it was so difficult with all the requirements. You can imagine in 89, we didn't have internet really, we didn't have all those things. That I decided to make it a place where I could accommodate programming across the board. I could work with secondary schools, I could work with tertiary institutions, I could work with professional development institutions, and I can work with individuals that had the idea that whatever they were, wanted to teach or learn, that breadth of that information could be expanded by including Africa in it. All right, your name and what is your role in here? Okay, I'm Kofi Debra okay. and I've got my company Oko Forests. And so we, we, we build forests, we're about agroforestry, about mixing agriculture and forests. And so I've been working in agroforestry for about five years. And from my website, I get a lot of people contacting me. Oh, how do I do this? I've got land here. I want to do this. I want to do that. I've got people from calling me from the UK, from France, from US, asking about agroforestry and how they can get involved in agriculture in Ghana. Mm. And you know, I'm doing my work. So it's like, I'm not an educator. Mm. So I just put, said to God, it's like, I, I need to, uh, to partner with someone, an institute, to, so that we can form a community and educate people, create content, and just teach people about agriculture and the role of forests in our environment. Mm. Oh. And then, then I met Auntie Renee. Wow. Yeah, and so we've been talking for some time and it's just, it's just amazing how things are happening. Things are just, just coming together. And so now we're, we're gonna start an educational program mm. here at Kokrabita Institute on, on agriculture, on forestry, on how we can regenerate our landscapes because unfortunately this modern agriculture we're doing is we're destroying our land. But if we look back, we know that we used to live in harmony with land. We used to regenerate our landscape. That's just what we did. So that's, that's, that's what I'm doing here. Thank you so much for talking to me. Add the motion blocks, the one that point towards F. The reason is simple. We want your spaceship move towards F. You get it. So what we can do now is we go to costume, which is here. And then we turn your spaceship like a 90 degree, which give you this direction to F. So what you do is put your Kessa on the spaceship. Click on it. Good. Take your time. So now you see this thing here. Try to see like you want to turn it. Turn it the other way. It doesn't work the way we wanted it. So now another option is, you see this flip horizontal. We are going to use that one to give us the perfect turn that we want. So we try that one then we see. I just wanted to know, okay. what is your role in Kokrobite Institute? Actually, um, Kokrobite Institute is a partner of Grow Ghana, we partner with Kokobite Institute because of their educational project that they do. And what does Grow Ghana do? 
Grow Ghana, our main focus is bringing digitalization into the community. Because one, we think that the world is growing in terms of IT sector, and we want to improve the education system in the young one's life. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. We try. <laughs> And to Renee, yeah. you know what? I know you have a message for your fellow brothers and sisters living in the diaspora. If I should give you an opportunity to send a message to them, what would that message be? I think the most important thing is to really be able to understand your own humanity. Not to be defined by political structures that constantly want to see you as other. To understand that you have enough, the right to take your place in the family of man. And like all men, we come from someplace worth remembering. And our story, the African story, and our particular part of the African story that has some intersection with a slave past, you know, is a rather noble history. You know, there was a time when I used to hear that history and I used to cringe and feel very small. But now when I think that I'm the descendant of somebody who lived in some African village, who came from great traditions, great artists, great thinkers, great scientists, and somehow through this plight was captured and, you know, forced on some long trek through unfamiliar territory, new faces, the terror of that, to get to the end of that trek to find myself jailed, at, uh, you know, in the dungeon on some coast you know, locked in some dank space with strangers who were horrifically frightened, who were standing in their own excrement, couldn't speak to each other. They somehow ended up getting on a ship, or living on the bottom of a ship for months at a time, again, under the most horrific conditions. And then after that, landing someplace where you were positioned on an auction block and sold like animals and branded. You know, when I think of that history, and I think of the people that endured that. I, I ask myself, whatever could make anybody get up in the morning when each day seemed worse than the next? And I knew one motivating factor had to be that they dreamt of the future. They dreamt about their children. And the day I realized I was that child, I understood the great privilege of that legacy. Not just the great privilege of it, but the great responsibility of it. And I felt an enormous sense of pride and an enormous sense of duty. And I knew that <laughs> coming from there, there was nothing I couldn't do. And um, I think through all of that, again, was the light of understanding my own humanity. And to be able to, in my case, defy uh, what do you call it, um, prophecy, because they passed me through what they call the gate of no return, and here I stand. So do you believe that we should make Africa home again? It is our home. Everybody doesn't have to physically go home, but it is our home. And I think those who wish to, we have a right to live any place we want to in the entire world. I am more than grateful to stand on Mother Africa. And I think everybody who has that desire should feel their right to come. That's really, I don't want people to think that when you came to Africa, everything was good. I mean, Africa is a paradise, like you just said. But what are the major challenges that you faced during your transition? Okay. When I said paradise, and this, that, that word is, is a word for the moments we're experiencing now. I, when I say paradise, I'm talking about the landscape, the environment I found, mm. that I was able to see nature, okay, see a sea that was unpolluted to see a landscape that wasn't littered with plastics, okay? To meet people, you know, when I came to Ghana, some people wouldn't consider it a paradise. There was no running water, uh, there were no convenience shops, there were no stores, <laughs> there were no lights, okay? And I'm not gonna say that wasn't a bit shocking for me, but what I did see, people living every day, you know, the first time I got a rash, you know, people knew what tree, what leaf to take, and you know, how to treat it so they could treat my, my rash. You know, I, and every day you buy my kenke, I buy your fish. People were picking their own leaves, going to the seaside. They were living in their world. They had, it, 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 there was this incredible intelligence 
that was not second nature to me. I always thought that literacy was confined to the ability to read, write, and comprehend the written and spoken word. And here I found a literacy where people were able to read their environment. People knew every tree, they knew the flora, the fauna, they knew what the bark could do, what the leaf could do, what the root could do, and I was blown away. But I think uh, when, when it comes to Ghana, for instance, I think we are trying to forget all these things. We used to eat in um, leaves, but right now we're using plastics. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are, and that's the unfortunate part, and that's why I'm grateful for some of the partnerships, and, 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 and that gives, helps me segue into how Kokrabite is grown. Because as I told you, what motivated me to come here was from the perspective of one landscape. After being here for 10, 12, 15 years, and watching what so-called development, this emerging market economy coming from the West has done to compromise the environment, to litter the environment, to put, I think, kind of, you know, unreasonable stress on local people. Now, the only thing they know about development is you need money. You have to pay rent, you have to buy gas, you have to pay electricity, you have to, you know. And, uh, and all, you know, because it, it wasn't organic, you know, people don't know what to do with plastics. It took the West a long time to figure it out, and they made it. So the, the landscape's littered, and, you know, it's, it's just kind of unfortunate. And on top of that, what you have is young people today that don't have the knowledge, the literacy that their parents had. They don't know the, what the environment gives them. They don't know all that sacred knowledge. And unfortunately, they're not educated to participate in that world of the emerging market economy. And seeing that firsthand and up close made me decide to change or broaden what we do at Kokrabite Institute, that we had a responsibility to live where we are. And I decided that I wanted to see if we could make something, provide jobs, create training, expand the way we think about our environment and the resources we have at our disposal and what we can do with them. Is there any my last question before I let sure. go? If you had a chance to change something in Africa, what would that change be? The education system. We have got to create an education system that allows people to understand first who they are, that makes them understand the importance of their history, okay? Because if we had a sense of history, if we were taught to be thinking people, nobody would come in and just replace everything we're doing. But what I learned is that I used to keep saying traditions are so important. It's not just tradition. It's being educated and conscious about what you're doing. Okay? Sometimes I ask people, oh, why are you uh, using that herb to do X, Y, Z? And they say, oh, because that's how my father did it, or that's how my mother did it, or that's how my great-grandfather did it. But an education, ed educated person can ask, answer the question, what am I doing and why I'm doing it? And if you knew why you were doing it, nobody would come and give you pesticides. Okay, if you knew what you were doing and why you were doing it, nobody would give you a plastic bag for your, your leaf. Nobody would give you a plastic bucket for your clay pot if you knew why you were doing, what you were doing and why you were doing it. So education for me is key. And I can tell you, if Africans were well educated, none of them would be leaving here because Ghana, like most of Africa, is a landscape of endless opportunity. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. <laughs>